So welcome back, and now it's time for me to have a chat with Fritz Merkel, who was on my panel earlier. Fritz is retired member of management board of OHB SE, and OHB is also a proud sponsor of Asteroid Day. But before I ask the question that is relevant of why it is important to sponsor Asteroid Day, I wanted to give a bit of a history on OHB, because I know it was founded by a female uh, founder back in the 1980s. And tell us a bit about the um, exploration and development of OHB. Yeah, um, OHP started as founded by a woman and uh, it was in the early 80s and um, with five employees, really started small. In the beginning it focused on uh, hydraulics for ships. It's uh, born in Bremen, so ship hydraulics was close to port and harbor and uh, shipbuilding. And a few years later, Mrs. Fuchs, Christa Fuchs, she hired her husband as engineer, as systems engineer and visionary also of space um, to the company. Uh, Manfred had the idea that the future is really determined by smaller satellites because microelectronics came up, micromechanisms, etc. So one could dis do satellites at lower cost, um, more efficiently build more satellites than rather the huge ones. And so based on this idea, OHB started to grow and uh, uh, one of the major contracts we had in the early 2000s, and which we often say brought an OHB be in the Bundesliga, so the Federal League, and a few years later OHB could even acquire the Galileo satellites, so for the European uh, navigation system, and today we have uh, 34 satellites under contract and 22 are already in space. So OHB has really a growth. It started really and still maintains the mental mentality of a startup even long before the term startup was existing. So, uh, but uh, it really, if you look today about a lot of startups, they have really is very, very similar development and OHB could be used as a type of textbook even how to do it. Thank you for sharing that story. It gives another perspective to OHP. And, and then to, to the question of why is it so important to support Astro Day, as you've been doing for quite a long time? Yeah. Uh, OHP uh, looks into all fields of space. So we do the application programs, telecom, navigation, Earth observation. Uh, but exploration is really uh, very strong in mind of also our own family. OHP is largely family owned. And um, we see here really an obligation also uh, to act and to uh, support the future of mankind, of humanity on Earth, because it is clear uh, that one day there will be a major impact and we have to start to date to learn what is a threat. We know there are asteroids, we do not know them uh, very well. We do not know how many and uh, how often they are coming, so we have to learn how to observe them. And we have to work on technologies and measures how to deviate them. And I think in parallel also one learns a lot of what uh, these uh, heavenly bodies are really made of. So it will tell us about our yeah, history. Uh, so it, in a parallel, science, technology, and protection. And I think this is really what motivates OHB to uh, look into this um, direction. And uh, OHB thinks the Asteroid Day is an excellent platform to disseminate these ideas, to communicate them, to involve young people, yeah, basically to bring uh, the society in the right this mood and spirit. Well, thank you so much for your constant support of Astro Day and continue the good work. Thank you, Fritz. And with that, over to Jessica. Hello there. As Fritz was just saying, um, asteroids can tell us so much about other planets, but they also offer valuable resources for life on Earth and for space exploration. So we're in Luxembourg today. Three years ago, Luxembourg announced its um, space mining ambitions. A year ago, it launched the Space Agency. And now the country has around 50 new space startups and institutions. So we're delighted to have five uh, of those uh, people from five of those startups here today. Our first guest is a Luxembourger who has worked for the French Space Agency and for NASA. Since last year, he has been COO of the newly created Blue Horizon. Nicola, what is Blue Horizon developing? And what are its implications for life on Earth and space? 
Yeah, so um, first of all, I would like to say that uh, Blue Horizon is basically a young startup founded by OHP Venture Capital and by OHP Luxbase, the latter being another company here in Luxembourg. And um, Blue Horizon, if you will, is really uh, all about exploring life sciences, or I should say space life sciences. So the idea behind it is really to see to what extent, or the bet, is really to see to what extent space life sciences are ripe for new space. To what extent can you commercialize products, services, applications with technology that has originally been de uh, be developed for uh, space. So for instance, what we are doing in space is basically focusing on technology for life support systems, human life support for space exploration, but also uh, microgravity research on the ISS, for instance, where you have interests to go deeper to space with it, but also potential commercial customers on Earth, for instance, from the, um, the medical or pharmaceutical industry. So here, too, we're trying to develop payloads, bioreactors, and uh, other things that, uh, yeah, that can be done. Great. Now, Blue Horizon is based in Betzdorf. That's in the east of Luxembourg. And it's a historical site because it's where the satellite operator SES established in 1985. And that was one of the first space companies in Luxembourg. Um, so why did your company choose Luxembourg? And does, it have, uh, does the Betzdorf campus add anything? Well, there's certainly a, let's say, a legacy or traditional reason in the extent that OHP has already a long-standing presence in Luxembourg, also through Luxspace, which is our sister company. And so for us, it was a pretty natural choice to also be located in Betzdorf. And so we are just uh, up the road from Luxspace. And yes, on top of that, the, um, the campus of SES itself too is, uh, let's say, I would say very beneficial for young starts up like us. There's also other ones, uh, other companies that are at the same floor than we. Thank you very much. So our next guest is maybe the newest arrival in Luxembourg, JJ. Um, he's the manager of Maiden Space Luxembourg, um, which established here six months ago. So JJ, what are you developing here and how does it differ to your activities in the US? Mm, Maiden Space um, is mostly known uh, as a first company that built 3D printer that works uh, in space, um, uh, on board the International Space Station. And um, right now our flagship program, uh, flagship program in, in US part, is a spacecraft called, called Arkinaut that will be simply used for printing and uh, assembling uh, you know, part in space to build large objects like solar farms. And um, working on the Arkinaut, uh, 3D printers are one of the key technologies and robotics arm are, are second to make this uh, assembly. Um, we found out an idea that it's also a great opportunity to move this part of the business to Luxembourg, since we were talking how, with Luxembourgish government, how we might uh, set up a, another company here using the, you know, the spirit of Luxembourg. Uh, to invest in space. So simply in, uh, in Luxembourg, we produce robotic arms, uh, not only for, for Arkinaut, but for many other robotic operations that, that are coming, like uh, lunar exploration, like satellite servicing. I hope that at some point, uh, asteroid exploitation as well. Fantastic. So JJ is originally from Poland, where there's also a growing space scene. Um, JJ, what do you think is Luxembourg's edge on the other European countries as a cluster for new space? Mm, Poland is a newcomer to space. Uh, it joined the European Space Agency around eight years ago and also is considered as a you know, country that is still developing its economy. So when it comes to investment to space, there, there are much lower resources than in, in comparison to Luxembourg. There is you know, much lower aversion to, to risk because of these resources. So in in countries like Poland, you will still need to put a lot of effort to convince many you know, um, decision makers to, to let you, you know, invest uh, in space to do interesting space things, especially in new space. So in comparison to this, uh, Luxembourg is a like, beautiful area. Everything is going much faster and on the higher scale than in, in newcomers, actually. Uh, 
because of Luxembourgish resources and focusness on space investment. Okay, that's good to know. So our third guest is, um, represents the European office of a Japanese company called iSpace. Now, iSpace grew out of the Google Lunar X Space Prize. So, Julian, please tell us, what is iSpace developing here in Luxembourg and what problems does this solve? Thank you for this question, Jessica. As you just mentioned, iSpace is an international company. We have close to 90 people spread over Japan, Luxembourg, and the US. And everyone at iSpace is motivated by one vision, a bold vision, which is to use the moon as the stepping stone to develop a new space economy. A space economy that not only will develop uh, the business on the moon, but also improve life on Earth by establishing a circular economy involving the Earth and the moon as one ecosystem. Um, and the key to this will be resources, resources on the moon, uh, chiefly water, which we know is there and uh, is waiting for us to use to produce uh, water that can be uh, you, you know, consumed by astronauts, future lunar residents, oxygen and fuel for rockets, uh, fuel cells to power every system on the moon. Um, and iSpace has a three-step roadmap to implement uh, this bold vision. First, establish the transportation system that will create the link between the Earth and the Moon to send instrumentation, all the robotics that's needed to do the infrastructure. And then go into the resource exploration phase to really map out where all those resources in detail that will lead to the resource utilization. And here in Luxembourg, we're focusing on step two and three. We have a uni unique team, a really diverse skill set. We have a lunar geologist, a mining engineer that are working on how to best plan the exploration of the resources on the moon. Um, we have engineers looking at how to integrate the best instrumentation to find resources on our robots. Uh, we have navigation engineers to do the mapping of the lunar environment. We have data scientists to create the new Google Maps using all those data. Um, and we hope that you know, with this new Google Maps that will show resources, um, some people here in this room that are right now in high school will be able to create the next startups uh, for the new space economy. Thank you, Julie. And for the people in our audience today, um, you can actually see the, the lunar rover outside on your way out. And Julian will also be available tomorrow here to answer questions. Is that right? Yeah. Right. So on to our next guest. OQ Technology is another homegrown new space startup in Luxembourg. Um, but this time, it's got its sights a little bit closer to Earth because you work on satellite technology. Yes. So Omar Kese is an engineer, and he's worked with several <coughs> space agencies. Um, so Omar, what is OQ? developing that can help our world? Yeah, so um, thank you, Jessica. OQ Technology is a new space startup that started in Luxembourg, from Luxembourg. Uh, and our aim really is to bring the internet of things and machine-to-machine -machine communication everywhere in the world using uh, small satellites. And uh, this is actually what we realized, because if you see today, like uh, in 2008, the number of devices and machines connected to the internet is the same as the number of people. That's in 2008. And now more machines and devices are connecting to the internet. And it's expected like 50 billion devices to be connected by 2020. And the problem is, in cities, that's OK. You have cellular, you have Wi-Fi. But the moment you go out of city, there's no more coverage. There's only traditional expensive satellite coverage. And we're trying to disrupt uh, this field. And we're trying to bring uh, the machine communication in the world in remote or rural areas using very small, tiny satellites. And in particular, which industries are you working in with the satellites? Uh, again, in, in particular, which sectors are you, are you going to be offering yeah, services? So we are focusing mainly uh, on the energy sector, uh, also on logistics and uh, maritime applications, and also the industrial applications. Uh, mainly, for example, there are a lot of uh, environmental impacts that could be um, uh, prevented using Internet of Things communication. For example, oil spills, uh, leaks in petrol pipes, uh, or, for example, monitoring clean water, water purity in different parts of the world, which we see also aligns with the UN sustainable goals, for example, having clean water for everyone. So the number of applications are a lot, uh, but we're mainly focusing on these four sectors that I mentioned. So it's really, really important for our survival, what, you, what you're developing. Um, so Omar previously worked for SES, and that's a satellite company we were talking about earlier. And um, is that the reason you decided to establish your business here? Because you were already, you knew the country through SES, or was it more to do with the space mining initiative? 
Well, uh, of course, the space mining uh, initiative was uh, uh, a very big motivation and uh, also the interest in Luxembourg government to support new space activities, which uh, happened to be at the, around the same time. Uh, but also, like having this ecosystem in Luxembourg of big and small companies in space uh, is a big advantage also. So uh, both reasons uh, are actually uh, play a role. Well, we're happy to have you here. So uh, we're moving on very, very quickly. Um, our last guest works for a company which is in a similar orbit to OQ. So Katerina, you are a familiar face in Luxembourg. I believe you previously set up offices for your last employer here, and now you're doing the same for the Danish nanosatellite firm, uh, GOMSpace. So please tell us what is GOMSpace working on right here in Luxembourg? Sure, so like you said, we're headquartered in uh, Denmark, but our Luxembourg office is up to some very exciting projects. We have our mega constellation operations platform. And what we're seeing in the commercial satellite industry is a shift to constellations. So um, this platform will allow operators to not only focus on just an individual satellite, but the whole mission, kind of a higher level. Um, and of course, the uh, very exciting missions like MARGO, which is the miniaturized asteroid remote geophysical observer. So that's a nanosatellite that will rendezvous with an asteroid, as well as Juventus, which is one of the CubeSats on Hera. So very exciting times for us. Um, so I, I've noticed that GOMSpace is in the news a lot recently, and um, that's because a lot of the partnerships that you form uh, with, with local companies, I believe, and one of the partners uh, is here, OQ Technology. Uh, Luxembourg is a very small place, it's quite normal, I think. So was that part of the attraction, coming to Luxembourg, the fact that you could form these partnerships, and has it paid off? Yeah, so... Luxembourg is really creating a thriving ecosystem for innovators in the space industry. Uh, so not only are there plenty of companies to collaborate with, uh, Luxembourg is also attracting internationally minded individuals who want to contribute to uh, science and technologies in space. And uh, we've definitely benefited from that. Well, that's fantastic. We actually still have a little bit more time and maybe we can talk a bit more about where you guys are located. We mentioned that Nicola is in Betzdorf. Uh, where are your offices? So we're located currently in the Technoport in esch sur um, but we'll be opening our own office soon in the same area. Great. Okay, so to, just to explain to people, the Technoport is a kind of collaboration area, a co-working space? Yeah, so it's an incubator, um, and there's plenty of other small companies and got to know that whole group of people, and, and we've been really privileged to have that energy, that very good startup energy to, you know get right in here and be a part of the Luxembourg community. Fantastic. So Julian, I've already been to your headquarters. They're very interesting. Tell us, where, where are you based? Tell yeah, me. we've been uh, the Povert uh, incubator for two years. Um, and uh, recently we constructed the first and only lunar yard uh, in Luxembourg to do research on navigation and invite um, anybody, old and young, uh, to come and check it out and uh, drive our rover on the, the lunar yard. It's like a big sand pit, essentially. I like uh, Lino Yard better than train. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're located in the city, or just outside the city centre near the train station? Right, we're five minutes from the, the train station, which is very, uh, very nice. Okay. What about yourself, Omar? Where, is, where are OQ based? Yeah, well, we started in a small office in Vassabelish in the east of Luxembourg, but we moved recently to Vodafone Innovation Centre, Tomorrow Street, which is the incubator there, which is at the city centre in Kirschberg here. Okay, so to explain, Kirschberg is the business di district of Luxembourg so City center, yeah. and uh, a good place to meet to potential financiers, I suppose. But lastly, JJ, you share the site with another person here. Exactly. So we are uh, we, with Julian in uh, the iSpace in the same building and um, in the same incubator, Paul Vert incubator. Uh, I believe it's because uh, Paul Vert um, has a, a lot of space that uh, when the companies would be, would be growing, we, we could, you know, take for our purposes, especially hardware companies that, that you know, must, must have a lot of facilities and workshop to simply um, build hardware. Um, so we, we are the same uh, incubator. We'll see maybe someone from newcomers will join us as well there. Yeah. Great. Again, so this is um, JJ is based near the train station in the uh, Paul Wirt Incube. Um, so we, we kind of see these kind of uh, co collections of uh, companies around the train station, but also in Betzdorf. Have you guys thought about an idea, of, and also in Bel Esch Belval, 
ever thought about a space campus? Do you think that's something that could work for Luxembourg, Nicola? Sure, I, I think it would be a great idea, actually, having all these different guys together, talking, exchanging, discussing. That's certainly something, I mean, uh, that would be beneficial in the sense like we are at Bad Stuff. Sure, there are some companies there. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to know that many of them nevertheless are spread out over the entire country after all. Sure. So for us, we too, we do have some labs uh, in Belval, which we're using from time to time, but yeah, certainly a good idea. So I think we've run out of time there. I want to thank you all so much for sharing your insights. It's been fascinating. I hope the audience today can meet some of these great entrepreneurs and be inspired. We're now gonna hand over to Christine at the museum. Thank you. I'm here with Eric Bettini. He leads the astrophysics department at the museum. Eric, where are we right now? Well, we are here in the um, uh, meteorite collection of our museum. We are showing here the three different kinds of meteorites, stony meteorites, mixed meteorites, iron meteorites. And uh, we want to explain to our visitors um, what is the origins of these meteorites, uh, how, uh, when, how, where they're formed and where they, do they come from. That's an excellent question. Where do they come from? Well, meteorites are, of course, um, extraterrestrial material, but uh, they were here. All these meteorites were found all over the world in different, in different uh, continents and all different countries from Europe, Africa, uh, America, Asia, all over the world. And a bit early, you mentioned the composition of a meteorite. You mentioned iron and stone, so this sounds like it must be really heavy. Yeah, of course, meteorites are heavy, especially iron meteorites. I've, here got, a, I've got a fragment here of an, an huge meteorite that uh, fell in uh, 1947 in uh, Russia. It's a secret alien meteorite. And this fragment here has only a weight of, uh, only a weight of uh, 8 kilograms, but the, the, the meteorite itself has an, had a weight of, of uh, 30 tons. But uh, if you hold this in hand, you can imagine that uh, if such meteorites uh, fell on, on a car, on a, on, a, on a house, you can imagine the, the damage this it caused. Do you want to try it? Yes, sure. Okay, yes, this is very heavy indeed. Thank you so much for this, Eric. We're heading back to you to the studio at RTL. Thanks, and now we are ready to connect with the Northall Branch Observatory. We have Daniel in Germany just joining us for this interview. Hi. Daniel, it's a pleasure to meet you again. Hello, nice to join. I know that you had a very important news recently because now your observatory is part of a, the International Asteroid Warning Network. And I would like you to comment on this very, very important accomplishment. Yes, thank you. Um, so we were, um, we were doing some, some work on asteroids for a couple of years now. And we're very happy to join the IAWN uh, earlier this month. So um, the IAWN is a UN-recognized network of asteroid observers and um, and people who are involved in the um, in the asteroid threat. And so, um, yeah, we're very happy to um, to be able to help them with uh, increasing the the awareness about asteroids, and we're hoping to do that with our, with our public outreach activities on Facebook and Twitter, and of course with our own observations. So we are, we are of course, observing asteroids ourselves. So thank you very much, Daniel, and of course, congratulations for this very important news, and I'm sure you will be even more inspired looking up and observing asteroids. Thank you very much, and happy Asteroid Day. Thank you. I'm still in Luxembourg City with Matt Dawson and Noah from the Lycée Armazinde has joined us. He's working currently on a school project he will talk about a little bit later. Uh, Matt, how many asteroids have you discovered so far with this telescope? Well, with this telescope we've discovered, uh, we've had six confirmed discoveries. M my partner Eric Butini from the Natural History Museum and I kind of work as a team. And we were very lucky that the first one we discovered um, back in 2006 uh, was actually, we discovered it actually only about two weeks after this telescope was finished. Yeah, wow. so, yeah that, was, that was fun. And you have, of course, also a question to Yeah, make. yeah. Um, how far can you see with this telescope? Well, um, when you're looking at it with your eye, um, 
the furthest thing I've ever seen is a quasar, an active galaxy uh, called 3C273, romantic name, and that is about 2.4 billion light years away. And you have to remember that you're also looking back in time, and to see a little dot that is where the light has been traveling for 2.4 billion years through space is quite an amazing feeling. And as far as asteroids are concerned, when I put this camera, this CCD camera on the telescope mm -hmm. and take images, well, for instance, the first asteroid I ever discovered um, was magnitude 19 or 20, and that's the scale of brightness of objects in the sky. And that is the equivalent to seeing a candle from Luxembourg held up in Spain. So it's pretty fine stuff. Impressive. And we'll hear more about this later and about the importance of discovering asteroids. But back to you to the Sacre Cité for now. Hello, it's Scott Manley here at Asteroid Day Live, and I am here with Nicholas Faber of Blue Horizons. What, so what do you guys do? Yeah, so Blue Horizon, well, it's a young startup that's all about space life sciences, actually. So it's really this idea to see to what extent can you develop technology, know-how in general, that is a real use for humans, for space exploration, but also for life in microgravity on other bodies as well. And this technology, which at the same time would have right now already at very much a shorter term a use on Earth. So, for instance, you can picture one example like um, recycling systems for waste, whether it be organic waste or other kinds of waste that would occur on a longer trip to, let's say, the moon or Mars or whatever. At the same time, you can picture the set that such technology can also be useful already on Earth today. I mean, it is already done today, but we think that we can do some cutting-edge stuff here that is simply worth doing. So how does Blue Horizons in general fit in with the theme of Asteroid Day? Well, Asteroid Day is all about, I would say, the greater vision, the greater idea of not just staying limited to LEO, of not just doing business in GEO, but really trying to go the next step and, as they tend to say often, expanding the human uh, sphere of economy, so to say, in this case. Yeah, and so we are completely willing to take up that bet and really see to what extent can you be a, a profitable company that really embraces, on the one hand, this greater trip of humanity to outer space and at the same time staying put on Earth and doing some stuff that matters today. I see. So you're all about uh, working on space, on life outside of Earth, and with a view to, of course, improving life on Earth at the same time. True, true. I mean, completely. So, for instance, the kind of bioreactors we are uh, currently developing, on the one hand, they will certainly be of use in a bigger uh, system of human life support. But at the same time, and me, I mean, already today, you do have bioreactors on Earth that are recycling certain material or certain waste, whether it be organic waste of which you can produce biodiesel, for instance, or uh, even with microalgae, you can certainly produce food on Earth today and here. And at the same time, you can use, I mean, the same idea of spinning this along space and Earth. You can use the same thing uh, in space. Okay, well, thank you, Nicholas. So we're going over to Sabina now. Apollo 9 astronaut Rusty Schweikart likes to remind us, we are the crew of Spaceship Earth, and it's our obligation to protect our planet. And what better way than outstanding programming like Asteroid Day Live, which teaches us about the origins of our solar system and key actors in its creation, like asteroids. Asteroid Day Live is the only programming dedicated to introducing you to many of the most prominent asteroid experts in the world. We learn by listening to them share their personal experiences and knowledge of how our solar system was formed, how it is evolving, and how we can protect our beautiful blue planet. But this programming wouldn't be possible without the generous support of major sponsors, including the government of Luxembourg and you. You play a critical role in our ability to shine a bright spotlight on the leading work of astronomers, engineers, scientists, space mission operators, and astronauts, our global rock stars, 
who bring the topic of asteroids closer to people of all ages and remind our government leaders of the importance of funding planetary science. Asteroids play an important role in our lives, from the formation of our solar system to their extraordinary value for future resource utilization to enabling ongoing exploration of our solar system and finally, when they impact our home planet. Asteroid Day is more than just a broadcast program. It's thousands of independently organized events in 192 countries. These events are the heart and soul of Asteroid Day as they connect and engage students on the subject of asteroids. For many students across the world, Asteroid Day is their only opportunity to listen to, learn from, and to meet astronomers, astrophysicists, and astronauts, heroes of the STEM generation. Your support enables the growth of our network of independent event organizers so more events can take place. It allows us to not only encourage the future generation of scientists, but to grow our online library of educational tools, enabling more people to dig deeper into asteroids and to connect to scientists, observers, and astronauts. Your support enables us to meet the goals of the United Nations Office for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Affairs by generating awareness of what we can do to protect our planet. Please consider becoming part of this movement by donating to Asteroid Day today.